I'm sure with that we would like to partner with you again and uh, hear out the very clear substance remarks that you place. They are quite hard hitting. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful discussion. Moving on with our program, uh, now I have the next speaker here with me uh, with a very different profile, but nonetheless very, very interesting. I have Mr. Rajneet Samuel. He is attached to Siemens Healthineers corporate office in Bangalore. He has 22 plus years experience in the industry with very broad roads in streamlining operations and new hospital project setups across his group. He has been previously associated with healthcare giants like Manipal Hospital, Columbia Asia, Fortis and Max Healthcare. He specializes in areas including modular OT, HVAX, uh, RO plant for dialysis, CSSD, and so on. So welcome, Mr. Samuel. And today we look forward to hearing you speak on maintenance program in BE. A very warm welcome to you for this EQB session organized by Kahul. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, time that you've given me, 15 minutes. I uh, all for coming and joining uh, for this three-hour session. Um, I I'll be covering uh, the maintenance program in a biomedical engineering department. Um, and um, like the previous speakers did mention, uh, it is a challenge to have biomedical engineers in hospitals. Now, now certain hospitals do have their own in-house engineer, biomedical engineering team in certain occasions, certain hospitals do outsource it. So uh, having a broader understanding of the maintenance program uh, is something that we will cover in this next 15 minutes. So I have three main areas that I would talk on, the preventive maintenance. Uh, I'll cover it next with the training and the last topic would be breakdown or call management. Now, uh, I have uh, always um, referred to the WHO standards uh, if you look at this slide, there's a QR code there. If any participant wants to scan this, you can land up at this uh, at the PDF document for, for of this uh, particular uh, uh, the medical equipment maintenance program, and it's very elaborately described. So I've taken some certain uh, extracts from this to uh, run through the uh, preventive maintenance program. So. To start off with, every piece of medical equipment uh, needs to have an EM number or the equipment management number. Now, this is derived, um, uh, this is how it's described in the WHO document, that it uh, every equipment has a function, it has an application, it has a maintenance uh, module, and it has history. Let me explain this. Now, every piece of equipment is either therapeutic, is either diagnostic, or analytical, or it could have some other function. Now, so based on uh, on the piece of equipment, uh, the end user or the biomedical engineering team, will, or along with maybe support staff in the hospital, can derive um, where where does it fall in, and it, they can allot a point for it. And uh, following this, what are the risks that this particular equipment can? Um, come up with during its use. So, um, and here you have the point score. And here again, you would kind of give it an, a score for the piece of equipment. And, and what kind of a maintenance schedule it needs to go through uh, on, a, on a yearly basis, okay? So these are the guidelines. And that, what kind of failures do, do these equipments have? Uh, so is it, uh, do the, does this piece of equipment fail once in six to eight, uh, six to nine months, or um, it's insignificant. Accordingly, the number is given. It's either a plus two or a minus two. Once all these numbers are derived, um, uh, maybe we can use an Excel sheet and uh, write from our fixed asset uh, register. We can uh, put in the, uh, the, the details and arrive at the EM number. You see it's highlighted in red. So uh, numbers that are, uh, if you look at another column called class, it's included and N is not included. So uh, the preventive maintenance ideally um, should, uh, should be derived looking at this table, the EM number, and this is how it's scientifically designed. Now, uh, if you look at it, you can just take a sample of it. Um, anesthesia vaporizer, anesthesia machine is number 20. So definitely has to go through a, a maintenance program. 
Now you can see at the right at the bottom, it says annual or semi-annual or once in three months, three yearly, yeah, yeah. So preventive maintenance, the whole objective of it is to see if we can increase the life of the product and uh, ensure that it doesn't fail during use on the patient. So uh, this is an area which is, uh, which is not uh, focused during the lifespan. Uh, it's only a fix or a breakdown management that usually hospitals have an approach to. I think if uh, we were talking about in the previous um, sessions about uh, investment, about specifications, about buying the best technology, but if you don't have a very good uh, maintenance program, everything would, you know, in a very short uh, uh, time frame would come to an end. So uh, having a clear a protocol, having a cl clear plan is something that is essential for every piece of equipment, okay? So I think this clarity in mind is important and uh, you could refer to that document to see uh, your inventory or uh, your assets and um, scientifically design a methodology of uh, doing a, a maintenance program on it. So uh, this document also has samples of how um, what kind of a, a pro, uh, what kind of a maintenance needs to be done? And I've just taken an example of an infusion pump. Uh, and this is a general um, a general document. Uh, it's um, it's not specific to an OEM, and so uh, it could be used. And uh, there are even there are even documents where um, you could even document what has been uh, noted about the product in, uh, in, in this kind of, there's a PDF document, it could be printed out and uh, you know, ticked uh, after the inspection is done. So definitely there needs to be a team of biomedical engineers. And uh, uh, I think um, the ratio of, uh, of biomedical engineers to a hospital also, this is a different session. Uh, we can talk about it another, at another time, but I think this is something very essential for um, every hospital to have a very, uh, a very good protocol of uh, preventive maintenance and reporting these preventive maintenances once in or once in a quarter to the hospital administration. Uh, the number of machines that were planned, that uh, those that could have been done, those that could not have been done because of whatever reasons, justifications for it. And once it's done, a, a label has to be stuck on the product. So the end user has, uh, has a good visibility when the machine was serviced and when it's due. So let me go to the next slide. So and again, what I just spoke about, um, each of these numbers uh, for every machine, um, it's, it, it tells us how, how do we go about uh, doing the uh, maintenance once in six months or one or once a year, or oh, it's not necessary. It's only, it could be, you know, numbers 12 and below. It, uh, it just has a number, but uh, it could be only a repair only basis. So, uh, so there's effort. So we all know that um, time and uh, people are, are uh, not sufficient. And so we need to, uh, you know, appro appropriately allocate uh, manpower and you know time to get machine service so i think um, basic machinery uh, is just not needed but i think machines that are um, sophisticated or which has got you know which are invasive in nature definitely need to uh, undergo a preventive maintenance now just before taking up the breakdown uh, module i wanted to cover training so i intentionally put training before breakdown uh, my uh, my experience over these year, last 22 years uh, tells me that you know if I have a trained user, uh, end user, uh, and I'll come to that with an example in the next slide, uh, my breakdown calls uh, are drastically reduced. Uh, my expenses on the machines are um, come down drastically, uh, meaning my budgets for repair and maintenance um, are much lower. Yes, I do need to have contracts in place, uh, uh, comprehensive maintenance contracts or annual maintenance contracts. You know, but, you know, breakdowns due to, uh, you know, mishandling or, you know, untrained users. So what we call as, you know, uh, there's a module, um, well, each hospital sometimes do have called incident reporting. So uh, trying to analyze why the, what was the reason for the 
failure. So uh, training is something that you know uh, is very very important. Uh, budgets are not kept for training, but I urge um, participants and uh, uh, those uh, you all can influence to start making budgets for training. Um, and just just not equipment uh, main uh, equipment contracts, but I think having a well trained user is something you know which will really give you good productivity on the machine. Now. Uh, since we're talking the topic of training, um, this should be managed by either the clinical educator um, with, the, uh, with the support of the human resources team. Um, I specifically bring, uh, bring this term up uh, in this session. Uh, the reason being there are a lot of there's a lot of attrition in the, in the healthcare system. And when new staff uh, join, um, uh, the biomedical engineer is not aware or even the head of the department is not very clear so how do we ensure uh, that all the users in a hospital in the department are fully trained on the inventory in their department so i think um, a calendar has to be prepared a training calendar for the year now uh, which i didn't mention earlier even the preventive maintenance or the training calendar for every department should be provided in a hard copy in a printed copy to the department in a file and which they can refer to so uh, this has to be updated, and uh, the head of the department should uh, should have uh, details about what's happening on the inventory. So I think training is important, and uh, for the new staff, for existing staff, sometimes uh, what we call as legacy staff. I mean, people who have been working there for 20 years or, uh, or 15 years, or you know, been there for a long time, just say you know, training is not my cup of tea. But I think that's not the right approach. You know, technology changes, uh, features change. It's important to get uh, get abreast of what's happening. And so, if you have a motivated staff within uh, within a department, I think that's the key to you know get them uh, get uh, get other colleagues to come and join for the training. And training should be well thought of, well planned. It just not shouldn't be a, just a checkbox that's done. It should have a very good planning. And uh, I think uh, most of the time. Uh, as biomedical engineers or head of the departments uh, who think that their staff are trained are just assuming a lot. So I think this assumption thing has to go out and we should have uh, well-trained, certified uh, uh, staff who use the, use the machines. And a passport or a kind of a log logbook of training should, uh, should also be maintained by the clinical educator or the HR team. And so I think that's where you can see, you know, I've done, you know, two hours of training or three hours of training on different equipment. Now, taking an example, uh, here you see an MRI machine. Um, now, when a new machine comes in, we, we only think that the radiology team needs to be trained or the end user, what we call this. Now, I think, uh, in my opinion, there are other stakeholders who also need training. For example, um, the biomedical team. They need to understand um, if they never handled an MRI machine in the past, what is helium? You know, what are the pros and cons of managing helium? Uh, what happens if there's a quench in the in the magnet? And what kind of expenses? 40, 50, 60 lakhs. I mean, who is responsible if it, the OEM is going to say, no, it's the hospital's responsibility. So understanding that uh, the maintenance department needs to understand uh, the sensitivity of these um, sophisticated equipment. Um, uh, X-ray tubes, detectors, flat panels, uh, very, very, uh, very sensitive to humidity, uh, having about 65, 70 RH uh, electrical uh, voltages, amperes, uh, earthing, neutral. I mean, there are so many harmonics. There are so many parameters that uh, the maintenance department needs to understand because we should understand these teams sometimes come from non-healthcare setup. So they would have worked in a in a hotel or in an airline or in a mall, and uh, hospital equipment is uh, is very different. How do you how how we manage them? Uh, the projects team, uh, when an uh, when an RF cage of an MRI is built, mm, it cannot be punctured, it cannot be nailed or screwed. Uh, how do we handle an RF cage? How do we do the walls, the ceilings, uh, you know, the floorings of this piece of uh, uh, the shielding around the MR uh, board? Uh, housekeeping staff, I mean, what machinery can I take in to clean the, the floors, the walls, the ceilings? Uh, how The security uh, team, 
uh, frisking is important for, met for metal objects. Do they have a metal detector? Mm, uh, floor attendants, uh, uh, GDAs who are going all around the hospital, suddenly the, one day they see a new piece of machine, uh, it's, a talk of, it's a talk of the hospital, and then they, they may end up with a wheelchair or a stretcher, which is metal uh, going into the, into the MR room, and that could be uh, such a hazard. Uh, purchase department, sticking example, uh, when they get an indent for a fire extinguisher uh, from the radiology, do they understand that they need to get something which is MRI compatible? IT department, uh, do we understand that, you know, we have to train this team uh, to open the firewall, uh, to be able for the OEM to remotely uh, monitor the uh, equipment, okay? Uh, even the CSS department, for example, uh, MRI compatible laryngoscope, the blades of it, uh, I can't give a different blade set to the radio or to the MR uh, uh, team. So I think training is something which is essential. Uh, it should be well thought of, well planned, and it should be executed in a way that everyone is considered. So now coming to um, the a breakdown management or the call management, what we call as. Um, I have again broken it up into four topics. Um, troubleshooting, uh, factors that affect uh, the, uh, the proper functioning of these uh, equipment, and inspection and return to service, and how do we report or what's dashboards or cockpits, what we call as. Now, so another term, what we call as corrective maintenance, means we, how we fix a piece of equipment and bring it back to service. Now, the most important thing in a biomedical maintenance program is having a inventory or fixed asset register of all the equipment in a hospital. Now, when I say all, I, I even include surgical instruments. I even include medical furniture. I include, um, uh, there could be uh, nursing items uh, uh, which are important to be calibrated, even a weighing scale, that's important. Uh, baby weighing scales, important. So all these pieces of equipment should be brought into the fixed asset register. It should always match with the finance team. Uh, more usually in India, uh, we work on biomedical teams work on Excel sheets. Some don't even work on Excel sheets. And uh, some of the hospitals are privileged to have a software. So uh, I think uh, having a fixed asset register is uh, important. And from there, we know where the piece of equipment is lying in the hospital when we when the call is received. Now, factors that affect um, a failure uh, are uh, the following. If you can see it up there, it's written. Um, I think uh, while we design uh, our rooms, which was brought up in the previous uh, sessions, um, a proper design. Uh, uh, do we understand how to design a, uh, an operation theater? We just say modular OT. It's a big word. Lamina flow, it's a big word. HEPA filter, it's a big word. But um, what, do we, what do we understand in detail about it? You know, how many air changes? How does it really affect uh, what we are designing now, from a long-term perspective? So I think um, having, um, having all these parameters in place, um, having proper spares uh, that we procure from the OEM and not compatible uh, uh, spares from, you know, from somebody else, um, and it may be cheaper, but definitely it can affect the machine uh, functionality is something that we should avoid and avoid failures. Uh, accuracy uh, for an for a end user to, you know, monitor or, you know, what they see on their, um, on their screens. So uh, I think just take an example of the C-arm, a flat panel. If we do not maintain um, proper uh, air, um, air quality, you know, humidity, temperature, you know, air changes, the flat panel can fail. A one and a half crore uh, C arm can just, you know, stop working in the middle of surgery. And we all know that the shortage of uh, semiconductors across the world, deliveries and imports are taking a long period of time. I work for Siemens, so I, I know the internal story. It's a challenge. It's, it's true. It's real. And uh, getting spares on time is a big challenge. So how do we reduce failures. I think even though we say we have a maintenance contractor, but I think we shouldn't put all the burden on the manufacturer. It's there for uh, mitigations. It's me meant for risk. But I think it's, uh, it's important that we keep our machines in good working order. Now, 
you see this, uh, this is a format how uh, the, the call is registered, how um, what is noted about the problem. And you know, this has to be uh, put in a file recorded and copy of it can even be given to the end user and uh, it can be reviewed together. Now, after we've done all of this, um, we always, uh, we have data with us, but what do we do with this data? Uh, breakdown data, preventive maintenance data, training data, in fact, I'm just taking three areas what I just spoke. We need to analyze and understand uh, how we're, I mean, uh, where we, adhering to the uh, plans uh, that we had uh, you know, proposed. Uh, the turnaround times, um, was, it, was it as per the service level agreement, the SLAs that we had written in our purchase orders. So we need to see every manufacturer and uh, see if they are performing well. Can we uh, you know, uh, recommend them for the next purchase? So I think looking at your uh, dashboard or your, uh, having a bird's eye view of your data summarized, um, I think will will give you good clarity and good vision uh, into making the maintenance program more effective and giving those inputs to decision makers for replacements or new capex, you know, uh, buys. So I think with this, I end my slide. Uh, thank you for your uh, patience and understanding. Please reach out to me. My number is on the screen. If you have any questions.